Welcome back to the fifth video about the details of digital compasses, specifically the QMC5883L. In the previous video, we finally managed to calibrate that thing to a high degree of precision using the matrix method. And we also took care of some I squared C errors. Cut here, link in the description. Now it's time to take care of the noise. You've already seen that in part three, Cartier, link in the description. That's my azimuth, but back then I plotted that out or printed that out in the serial monitor as numeric value. And we back then we also saw it's fluctuating wildly uh, around a center line somewhere. Yes, but uh, here in this case, it's about -ish plus minus pff, eight degrees or oh, nah, maybe not quite, maybe plus minus five degrees. Yeah, that's what we saw back then too. Uh, the thing is it's fluctuating and I'm not moving my sensor at all. So we do have to take care of that noise. Okay, now I'm showing you again the plot of the raw data from our three sensors. And I moved the whole thing a little bit so all three lines are as close as possible together. So we get a nice dynamic range here in the serial plotter. I make a screen copy of that now and then we have a closer look. Upon closer inspection, it looks even worse. So I have here my X, Y and Z sensor raw data. And I tried to approximate the minimum and maximum values for each. So I get a delta of 160 least significant bits for my X sensor, 120 LSB for the Y sensor and just 75 LSB for the Z sensor. Now I went back to the calibration data we collected in part four. I recorded it already, link in the description. And I looked there for the dynamic range. So the difference between the minimum and maximum value for each axis. And for the X axis, that's 2694 LSB. For Y, 2599. And for Z, 2854. And if you put that into relation to the noise LSBs we have here, then it's for X 5.9%, Y 4.6% and Z 2.6%. That's really bad. Now, before we filter the hell out of our signals, let's first try to reduce that noise. In part three, card here, link in the description, when we talked about hard iron errors, I told you you don't necessarily need a real magnet to induce these errors in our little sensor, but any current generating a magnetic field will do. And current wise, there is a whole lot going on here directly in the neighborhood. So I cobbled together a little, well, jumper board to get our sensor further away from all that stuff. For some reason, I was unable to find a position here where the data from X, Y and Z sensor are really close together here on the screen. Uh, so I'm just uh, displaying now the data from the X and Y sensor that was simply rotating. And I will take a screenshot of that now. The good news is you can mount your magnetic sensor near your Arduino without any real penalties. The bad news is moving it away doesn't improve things. So on the blue X sensor, we have now a delta of 140 LSBs. That's 5.2%. Previously, we had 5.9%. That's not a significant change. We're talking noise here. And on the Y sensor, we have now a delta of 130 LSBs, 5%. That's even a little worse than previously, the 4.6%, but again, not a significant change. Now, let's talk about the relation between noise and signal range. And I try to draw it here to scale. 
Anyway, obviously we cannot do anything about the noise, but maybe we can do something about our signal range. And indeed we can. We're currently operating our little sensor at 8 Gauss full scale, but we have the option to operate it at 2 Gauss full scale, basically quadrupling our signal range and in relation quartering our noise level. Uh, that of course assumes that the noise will stay the same if we turn down the full scale. When your multimeter is displaying a very small value and you're turning down your range to get more digits displayed, you are applying exactly the same principle. So I changed in my setup the full scale range from 8 Gauss to 2 Gauss. Now let's do those noise measurements again. Okay, again, I don't touch that thing here and we see, uh, I don't know if you can read it, but uh, yeah, the scale went up quite a bit. So we do have more noise, but let's take a closer look. Unfortunately, our noise levels also increased significantly when we went from the 8 Gauss range to the 2 Gauss range. Remember, we increased our signal level fourfold. However, the noise levels also increased in that order of magnitude. So for the blue X sensor 4.1 fold, for the red Y sensor 3.8 fold and for the green Z sensor 3.3 fold. So no cigar. There's one more parameter we can play with and that's the oversampling rate and we go down here to 64. Again, just sampling the noise here, not moving anything. Decreasing the oversampling rate from 265 to 64 made things worse. So the blue X sensor now has a noise level of 700 LSBs, previously 650. Our red Y sensor is now at 600 LSBs, previously it was at 450. And our green Z sensor is at 400 LSBs now, previously 250. Of course, it would be completely negligent if we ignored the power rail. So I added two decoupling capacitors here. One 10 microfarad electrolytic and one 470 nanofarad ceramic. There is already a 100 nanofarad here on the breakout board. So we are measuring again and I'm still at a range of 2 Gauss but I switched back to an oversampling rate of 265 and as always I'm not moving anything here. And the results? Well, on our blue X sensor we had previously without the caps a noise amplitude of 650. With the caps that went down to 550. Same for the red Y sensor. We had previously 450 and we are down to 400. And for the Z sensor we are down from 250 to 200. So we have a little improvement all across the board. Normally I'd say this is just noise so not significant. But since it's down on all three sensors I'd say we achieved some improvement by adding this additional decoupling caps on the power supply. To summarize the noise avoidance actions we've taken. First, we try to remove all magnetic noise sources. That was not successful because obviously our Arduino Nano Avery is not really a source of magnetic noise. Second, we choose the lowest possible range of our sensor. That was also not successful because the noise level increased proportionally with the lower range. Third, choosing the highest possible oversampling rate obviously reduces the noise. And finally, fourth, filtering, decoupling or stabilizing your power supply is also a good idea. We saw some improvements there. Please note, these four noise avoidance techniques can be applied to any kind of sensor. The results we got here for each of the four are really QMC5883L specific. You might get other results with other sensors. 
Now that we've done our due diligence and know that we can't avoid the noise, let's filter the hell out of it. But when we are talking about noise reduction by filtering, we have to answer three questions first. One, where do we want to filter? Do we want to filter the raw data, the calibrated data or the azimuth data? Second, how do we want to filter? Three usual options are a modified moving average, a moving average or a moving median. And three, how many samples do we want to take for our filtering? The decisions we make here will of course impact our CPU and RAM usage. So if we filter the raw data, we have to handle three integers, two bytes or a total of six bytes each for each sample we are filtering. If we filter here the calibrated values, we only have to filter two values because we need only two for the calculation of our azimuth. So two floats, four bytes each, eight bytes total. And if we filter the azimuth, we only have to handle a single four byte float. However, we can easily compress that into an integer yeah, uh, from zero to 3600 without losing any real precision. So two bytes really. However, azimuth filtering might be really complicated because we have this circular data here that jumps between zero and 360 at the north. A modified moving average goes really easy on your CPU and RAM. You don't need to buffer any samples, simple operations here. A moving average needs a little bit more RAM. That is in fact you have to store somewhere all end samples over which you are filtering. It's still easy on the CPU with some optimizations. You don't need to do the sum of all samples each time. A moving median, that's heavy. First, you have to store somewhere all your end samples and then you have to sort the samples to find actually your center value. So that's heavy on the CPU and the RAM. There are optimizations here, of course, but uh, yeah, it's still the heaviest option. Finally, you have to decide over how many samples you want to filter. But before we now <laughs> jump to conclusions and say of course we're doing a modified moving average filtering of an azimuth, that's the simplest option, we should revisit our noise. I've taken new noise measurements for our filtering efforts. So this is the raw data still at an 8 gauss range but now with an oversampling rate of 512 and with those decoupling caps in place on the breadboard. Compared to our initial noise measurements at an oversampling rate of 256 and with no filter capacitors on the power rail, we see here a meager improvement, it depends on how you want to calculate that, of 8.4%. But we already knew that our noise avoidance efforts were not really effective. We did saw significant changes when we switched the oversampling rate between 265 and 64, but that was a factor of 4. And now we are just doubling the oversampling rate from 265 to 512 and yeah, some effect but not really much. Looking at the calibrated data now, we don't see any significant change in the noise amplitude compared to the raw data. And yes, I've adjusted the value ranges for the calibrated data by putting all the raw calibration data through the calibration math. If we look at our azimuth, we have a noise amplitude of 14 degrees. That's 3.9% of the full 360 degrees. But how can that be if our calibrated X value has a noise amplitude of 5.5% and our calibrated Y value of 4.6%? I mean, the azimuth is just the Arcus tangens 2 of X calibrated and Y calibrated. The answer is correlated noise. And to explain to you what correlated noise means, I will give you a small example. 
I have here a differential signal on two lines A and B. Line A going from minus one to one and B going from one to minus one. And if we combine both lines in a receiver with a function A minus B, we get here of course minus two to two. By the way, I made a whole series about differential signaling with RS422, uh, one card here, link in the description. Now I've added here in red a little bit of noise to our signals. So what happens if we do an A minus B of our noisy signals? We get our signal again. For example, minus two minus zero is minus two again. And zero minus minus two is also minus two. Two minus zero is of course two and zero minus minus two is also two. This kind of noise is called common mode noise and differential signaling is completely immune to it. You could also say that the noise on our signal A and on our signal B is 100% correlated, that is identical. So if you take the noisy signal A and subtract from that the clean signal A, that's identical to taking the noisy signal B and subtracting from it the clean signal B. That's basically the noise that's overlaid onto our clean signals A and B. Of course, this is just a trivial example for correlated noise. And there are many other kinds of noise correlations you can have. Not necessarily between different signals, but also within a signal over time. Anyway, that simple example will help me to illustrate something to you. How do you think the output would look like if we averaged filtered our noisy signals A and B beforehand to get rid of some of the noise? Here in green just a two sample average filter. Our green output signal would look worse than just taking the unfiltered red inputs for A minus B. The noise on our azimuth being significantly lower than the noise on our X and Y calibrated signals that go into that arctang2 function to calculate the azimuth is at least a strong indicator that the noise on our sensor signals is at least partially correlated. Though proving that mathematically to you is really beyond me. Anyway, if we would apply some filtering here on the calibrated or raw values, we might destroy that correlation and make things worth in the azimuth signal. And if you think about it a little bit further, of course our X sensor and Y sensor signals are correlated. They are the sine and the cosine of the direction of the magnetic field. And if we not just have here some random amplitude noise on our signals, but also some directional wiggling noise here of the magnetic field, whatever the source of that is, we get a correlation here and we can use that correlation afterwards in the arctang2 function to reduce the noise again. And that answers the question where we should filter, of course here at the azimuth end. To answer the question how we should filter our azimuths, so with a modified moving average, a moving average or moving median, we will have to look at the properties of these three filtering methods beyond just CPU and RAM usage. All our three candidates, so the modified average or mean and the run of the mill average or mean and the median will perfectly filter uniform noise. Please note that uniform is a very informal way of describing noise. But they behave quite differently when it comes to transients. I have here one starting at zero and then going up to one. Our modified average will follow that transient like an RC element. So that's basically an E function here. So if we filter over N samples, after N samples we will only have reached here about 63% of the maximum and then it creeps slowly towards the one. 
That's fine for slow changing signals like from temperature sensors where I already used that uh, yeah, card here, link in the description. Anyway, uh, while well, compass here can rapidly transit from zero degrees pointing to north to 180 degrees pointing to south. So the modified average is not really suitable for our application here. Our normal average mean follows a transient in a linear fashion. And after our sample buffer is completely full with the new value, we will have reached the new value. Our median will jump up to the new value when approximately half of the sample buffer is filled with the new value. So for example, if we still have six zeros here in our sample buffers and four ones, then the medium, the middle is still zero. But as soon as we only have four zeros in the sample buffer and six ones, then of course the middle, the median is one and we jump up. Now that we've ruled out the modified average, let's talk about the behavior of the normal average and the median when confronted with a pulse. I have a pulse here jumping from zero to one and back to zero with a width of W samples. And our average mean will follow that pulse here in a linear fashion. And the peak we reach here is a W over our total number N of samples. Our median will either follow that pulse here with some time delay when the width of the pulse is greater than half the size of our sample buffer because then at some point the ones will have the majority in our buffer. However, it will completely ignore such pulses when the width of the pulse is smaller than half the size of our sample buffer because then the ones never get the majority. And we do have pulses here in our azimuth data. And by the way, they are even more prominent here in our calibrated data. So we can expect the best results for our application by using the CPU and RAM heavy hitter moving median. That leaves the last question, how many samples should we take for filtering? Most of our pulses here are just six samples wide or 0.6 seconds. Remember, we are sampling with 10 Hertz. However, if you look at that thingy, that's 20 samples or two seconds wide. To get over that smoothly, we would need approximately 50 samples or five seconds worth of data. But that would mean a rapid change in our compass direction would only show up in our filter data after two and a half seconds. We could of course increase the sampling rate and I've taken that picture at five times the sampling rate at 50 Hertz. But if you look at it, these are 100 samples or two seconds. We would need several hundred samples or order of magnitude 10 seconds worth of data to get a smooth line through here. So that's not really a solution. And I guess we'll have to live with that really slow response time of our filter. So all that's left to do is to implement a moving median for circular data with a discontinuity. Let me first point out that there's no mathematical definition for a circular median. So I have my circle here from zero and almost back to 360 degrees and the blue spikes are my data points. Whatever point you choose, you have to its left and its right exactly the same other data points. So yeah, no median here. However, if our compass is producing values in all four quadrants of the circle, something is very wrong anyway. Usually it will produce values in just one quadrant or two quadrants, worst case three quadrants. So we just throw away the quadrant with the least samples in it, which should be <laughs> zero samples anyway, and we don't have to handle a full circle anymore. 
Now, how to handle that discontinuity? If we excluded the data from that quadrant or this quadrant, we don't have that discontinuity at all. In the first case, our scale goes from zero via 90 and 180 to 270. In the second case, our data goes from 90 over 180 and 270 to 360. So no discontinuity. If both quadrants are included in our median calculation, then we rescale the upper half of our circle with the formula 360 degrees minus azimuth, giving us here now a scale from 0 over minus 90 to minus 180 degrees. And no, we won't have created a new discontinuity on the other side, because if these two quadrants are included, then either that quadrant or this quadrant is excluded. In the following, I will use an unusual quadrant numbering. So my quadrants will be numbered 0, 1, 2, 3. That's easy to calculate simply by taking the integer value of the azimuth divided by 90 degrees. So that's already code optimization. Before we have a look at the code, let's go over the algorithm. I have two arrays here, azimuth values and azimuth quadrants, both of the size azimuth samples. And I'm using them as a ring buffer to store my azimuth values. And at the same time, I look up in which quadrant a value falls. And I have a pointer azimuth current that points to my current sample. I also have an array azimuth quadrant count that contains the number of values in each quadrant. And this is all maintained incrementally while I execute the read data method. A new function azimuth median will actually give us the median of our azimuth data. The first thing that happens here is I use that array to determine which quadrant I should skip. And then I copy the data from the remaining three quadrants into another azimuth value sorted array that has the same size of uh, yeah, azimuth samples, but we only have here a certain number of valid samples. And if need be, I do that azimuth minus 360 degree transformation here. Uh, please note, I got that wrong in the previous doodle. Next, we sort the valid samples in our array using a private sort azimuth values method. That's basically implementing a quick sort. After that, we just have to choose the center value or values. If that is an even number of samples here, we have two center values. Perform yeah, the reverse transformation here if need be azimuth plus 360 degrees and we have our median. So the code and we are at version 8. In the header file, we now have a destructor because all these arrays are dynamically allocated and I need to free the memory if I destroy that object. I have a new method set azimuth samples, which of course sets the samples I'm using for the azimuth filtering. And by the way, I renamed azimuth set up to just azimuth. And I have a new function here, azimuth median, which will deliver us, of course, the median filtered azimuth. And here we have all the new member variables. We already talked about them. So azimuth samples is a byte, so I can handle at most 255 samples in my filter. The azimuth values array is, I mentioned that before, an integer array. So the values there run from 0 to 3600. Azimuth quadrants, I only need a byte array to store 0, 2, 3, and here's my azimuth quadrants count, and here's the pointer azimuth current for the azimuth values and azimuth quadrants arrays. And finally, we have here the azimuth values sorted array, of course, also just integer. 
In the CPP file inside the constructor, I have a whole bunch of new initializers for my new member variables. So my SMO samples is initially one, so no filtering at all. And I initialize all my arrays to size one and they are all filled up with zeros. Uh, accordingly, I fill my quadrants count array with one zero 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 and my current value in my arrays is the value zero. In the new destructor, I just delete all my arrays. In the read data method, we now do, if our read registers was successful, the azimuth calculation and historization. I increment my azimuth current here and if I'm at the end of my ring buffer, I go back to the beginning. I still do here the Arcus Tangens 2 calculation, we've seen that before, but then I turn the result here into an integer going from 0 to 3600. And I store that in my azimuth values array and I calculate the quadrant in which the value is and then I I do here an incremental correction of my SMUS quadrants count array and I also store the quadrant in the SMUS quadrants array. The new set SMUS samples method just takes the argument, does some checks here for validity, deletes all my data arrays and then allocates them new to the correct size and all arrays are initialized to zero. And accordingly, I initialize my quadrants count array also here to zero. And because that's all zero, all samples are in the quadrant zero. Asimuth, formerly known as Asimuth ZUP, no longer does the Asimuth calculation but takes the current value from our Asimuth values array and turns that back into a float between 0 and 360. Our new method, Asimuth Median, has of course some local variables here. We already talked about quadrant skipped and sample valid. This is just for loops and this will be our result. So first we determine which quadrant to skip. Then we copy all our data from the azimuth values array into the azimuth values sorted array. And we start out with valid samples zero. And we go over all the samples that are available. And if a sample is not in the quadrant we are skipping, then we check if we have skipped quadrant zero or three, if that's not the case. And our current sample is in quadrant two or three, we apply our transformation. Otherwise, we just copy the data. And of course, we increment the number of valid samples. Finally, we sort our array using the quick sort and I won't go into that code. Look it up on Google. Anyway, after sorting, if we have an odd number of valid samples, we just take the center value of the array and that's our median. Otherwise, we take the two center values of the array and take the average of both and that's our median. Finally, we turn our integer 0 to 3600 or negative. In that case, we add 3600 back to a float 0 to 360. In the sketch itself, inside the setup, after I do my set calibration, I do now the set azimuth samples. And I'm using here 250 samples because I experimented a little bit and Really, we need all the filtering we can get. In the loop, I print out now my normal azimuth, but also my azimuth median. Let's have a look at the serial plotter now. Okay, let's fire up that serial monitor uh, plotter, I mean. What you can see here probably in a second or two is the <laughs> yeah, transient reaction of our filter. So our median is red and our signal is obviously blue. 
Now we wait just a little bit until our values, are, yeah, until that stuff here from the startup is out of the way and we can actually uh, see something on a smaller scale here. Okay, so blue our normal azimuth and red our median filtered over 250 samples azimuth. And as you can see, yeah, yeah, not exactly a constant value, <laughs> even with 250 samples. I really don't know. Uh, what else we can do. I mean, we now have a 250 median, uh, 250 sample median filter on that thing here. Um, but let's try something else just to prove you that this uh, quadrant stuff and uh, rescaling stuff really works and we don't have any discontinuities anymore. Okay, it took me a while and <laughs> I cheated. I put a little magnet here uh, nearby. What I wanted to show you is when we are oscillating here between zero and uh, almost 360 degrees in our azimuth, that our filter, yeah, through all the quadrant magic is absolutely, absolutely unfazed by that. And yeah, you can see that uh, discontinuity here, but our filter totally ignores that. Very nice. But I want to try something else. That's not it yet. I just wanted to show you how slow that thing now reacts to changes in the compass direction. So this will take, well, 12 and a half seconds until we get our transient reaction here. And yeah, it is what it is. Uh, if you want to really filter that thing to, uh, well, at least approximately a uh, straight line, <clears throat> you have to compromise, I guess. So here's what I wanted to show you. The filtered signal on a smaller scale and one tick here is about three degrees. So we are within, well, one, 1.5 degrees uh, noise left. But not really noise, but you know, long time fluctuations in the measurements that thing is taking. So yeah. We, I guess we did everything we could to get a usable signal out of that thing. That's it for today and probably everything I'll ever do uh, with the QMC 5883L. I mean, uh, it was quite a journey. We went from this year over that year to a line within, yeah, compass direction within one, two degrees. And that's also what the data sheet promises you here. Uh, yeah, it says somewhere there, QMC 5583L enables one to two degrees compass heading accuracy. Uh, yeah, if you filter the hell out of it. But I guess we learned quite a lot. I mean, about calibrating these things. So uh, three axis magnetic sensors in general. About filtering, yeah, I think I never before used a median filter, but uh, it's, it's a important tool for processing digital data, for filtering digital data. So I initially thought this series will be uh, yeah, some <clears throat> relaxing stuff compared to my NMIA decoding series and I needed something to relax. It turned out uh, this thing here was harder to handle than I initially thought. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed it and uh, some lighter, really light videos will follow. Till then, bye.